reality, captured in user-friendly symbols and processed for understanding. The Idea Channel. Hello, I'm Ed Fulner, President of the Heritage Foundation, a Washington-based public policy research organization that is a think tank. Think tanks are basically idea factories. And we're in the idea business because we believe that ideas have consequences. Or, as John Maynard Keynes, the economist, said, it is ideas, not vested interests, which are dangerous for good or evil. Ideas basically are the raw materials of laws, which means that people here in Washington involved in the public policy process, like the Congress, officials in the executive branch, leaders in the national news media, have to depend on ideas as the raw material for everything they do. And it's those new ideas that think tanks in Washington are involved in presenting to the public policy makers. Our ideas here at Heritage are usually described as conservative. That is, we believe in promoting traditional American values, we believe in a strong national defense, and we believe in the free enterprise system and free trade. We believe that basically less government is better than more government. <clears throat> but you're talking about ideas, Ed. You're <clears throat> I assume you're talking about ideas transferred to action. Indeed. The idea by itself uh, is not enough. We think of, uh, in the public policy arena, the three I's, ideas, individuals, and institutions. The idea is the first basic raw material that begins the process. But that idea then has to be articulated by an individual. And that individual has to then make it happen and make it relevant, if you will, to the public policy makers. And that usually happens through an institution. Let me walk you through an example. More than 20 years ago, one of my great heroes, Professor Milton Friedman, began advocating the idea of tax cuts as a way of both increasing individual initiative and the entrepreneurial spirit that has made America great, while at the same time giving the individual more control over his own life, because after all, control over your own assets means control over your own life. And probably, at the same time, also leading to, uh, in fact, greater government revenue to carry out necessary government programs, because the more individual incentive an individual has, uh, the more likely he is to go out and be productive, and the more spin-off there will be that will be helpful to the government at the same time. Those ideas, though, at that stage of the game were basically uh, the raw material that were being advocated by one or two individuals. Back in those days, I was a uh, congressional staff aide in the House of Representatives. And when we thought about getting a, quote, conservative economist, unquote, in to testify before the, say, the House Ways and Means Committee, we always came up with a short list of three. Milton Friedman, Milton Friedman, or Milton Friedman. <laughs> well, these days, uh, we've got literally thousands of economists out there who are willing to take the same viewpoint because the early leaders who had these fundamental basic ideas of the worth of the individual and how to make the individual a uh, more productive entity, in fact, uh, were able to transfer those ideas and eventually the ideas being worked on by the individuals through institutions have largely become the law of the land. Okay. I, always, I always emphasize, too, uh, the importance of the institutional base. An institution provides more than a, a secretary or a library for the individual to work in. An institution is important because it addresses the whole other side, really, of the, the equation. On the one side, you've got the, the research on the ideas. On the other side, you've got to have the marketing of the ideas. And we believe that very strongly here at Heritage. Uh, an idea uh, that basically sits in a uh, book, 
on a uh, dusty shelf somewhere in a library is not having the kind of impact it should have. That's why we here at Heritage spend as much money every year on marketing our products as we do actually on producing them. Our marketing side spends as much as our research department uh, spends, which is, I think, very unusual for a think tank, but it's also uh, increasingly the way think tanks are tending to operate, that answering the, the old adage, one of my colleagues in a, at a different institution said to me not long ago that as far as he was concerned, when the book was published, the job was finished. I challenged that immediately. I said, when the book is published, the job is just beginning. Because the point then is to get the people, the key people out there to read that book and to get the key policymakers to at least read the editorial based on it or the op-ed piece that's written on it that's published in a newspaper or the uh, commentary on the nightly television news or whatever. In fact, quoting Milton Friedman again, when he participated in his uh, seminal series, uh, Free to Choose, on television, they, uh, he told me that, in fact, what he hoped would happen from people viewing that series of television programs would be that, in fact, the right 200 or 300 people would also read the book. And if that happened, then the whole process would have been worthwhile. I think <coughs> probably it did happen because uh, there have been so many changes in that area in, over the last few years. Your example and most of the activity that I'm aware of uh, undertaken by the Heritage Foundation is, is directed, is it not, toward change in government. It, uh, government is the target of your uh, ideas that you want to transfer into action, isn't it? That's right. Uh, we we're, are involved in the public policy process. Our objective is not to uh, change the corporate goals of uh, General Motors Corporation or uh, XYZ proprietorship on Main Street, uh, Youngstown, Ohio. Our objective is to change things here in Washington in the public policy process. If uh, General Motors decides to go one way in terms of its corporate culture and Ford goes another way in terms of their long-range planning and Chrysler goes still a third, uh, that's fine. Uh, one or the other of them, through a trial and error method, uh, will probably do better, and the others will adapt and perhaps borrow some of those ideas from the more successful one. But that's not impacting on everybody in the country. On the other hand, if you have 219 individuals over here outvoting 216 in the House of Representatives, it's going to affect you, and it's going to affect me, and it's going to affect our children. It's going to affect everybody. That's why we're involved in the public policy process here trying to work with individuals inside the government. And you are identified, I think fairly so, as a key player in the changes that have occurred during the Reagan administration. Uh, is there any evidence that, a, that, that the more conservative trend uh, that I think is d discernible uh, over the past eight years will remain in public favor on a long-term basis. C can, these, c can you sustain interest in conservative ideas for two or three decades? Well, I think you can. In fact, I think that the gestation period of a new idea really uh, has to be measured in terms of probably a couple decades anyway. The conservative movement, broadly speaking, really goes back to the early 50s to uh, William Buckley, Richard Weaver, Russell Kirk, Milton Friedman again, Frank Knight, some of the other University of Chicago economists, uh, Friedrich von Hayek, who was at Chicago and then later at various universities in Europe. And that intellectual movement then paved the way, really, during the Eisenhower era and then into Kennedy, uh, and provided the intellectual underpinnings for what then became the Goldwater uh, election, Goldwater versus LBJ in 1964 where everybody said, well, conservatives have lost. Uh, they only got 27 against 45 million votes. Uh, clearly, conservatism is dead in the United States. Well, in fact, what you had was Barry Goldwater articulating certain fundamental ideas that had come through the academic arena and reached him. Those ideas went out. They touched a very responsive chord among political leaders around the country and among grassroots citizens around the country to the point where, within four or five years, Ronald Reagan was a national figure as governor of the largest state in the United States. 
He actually ran, if you recall, 1968 against Richard Nixon, came reasonably close to becoming the Republican nominee for president. Then you had Nixon elected twice in 68 and 72. Uh, 76, again, Reagan came within a whisker of beating Gerald Ford in the Republican primaries and, uh, by, at the Republican convention in Kansas City. By 1980, it was ready to be handed to Ronald Reagan on a silver platter. Ronald Reagan, in effect, the personification of the conservative movement, of the ideas I've been talking about. But the ideas were there, and they preceded Ronald Reagan, and they were the fundamental bedrock on which Ronald Reagan, the political character, really developed. And no, when Ronald Reagan got into office, we can say, I think fairly safely, seven years later, that he hasn't put everything into, off, into practice that we would have liked. And there are a lot of political reasons for that. But as to how long those ideas are going to last, I think they're going to be around at least for another two or three decades. If you go back and take the last analogy where the role of government substantially shifted, you have to go back to the beginning of the New Deal in the mid-1930s when Franklin Roosevelt, one time a fiscal conservative, in fact, turned his early platforms and his early views on their head, came out with all kinds of programs for big government. And, sure, early on in the 1930s, you had major new social programs like Social Security and some others. But, in fact, it wasn't until the mid-1960s, until Lyndon Johnson was elected. Franklin Roosevelt was already 20 years in his grave. But it was when Lyndon Johnson was finally in office that you had the ultimate realization of the New Deal in the form of the Great Society, when LBJ was able to come in and just massively ram through the Congress uh, so many of those big government programs. In a similar fashion, I think it's going to take a while for the Congress to change, to move in a more conservative direction. And it's going to take a while for the full impact of these conservative ideas that really on the national scene were first articulated by Ronald Reagan to actually become public policy. So it's probably going to be sometime late 1990s, maybe early, 20th, early 21st century, early in the year 2000 or 2005, before we're really going to see the full fruition of what began, I think, tentatively and uh, marginally in the Reagan era of 1980 to 1989. Well, young people, <coughs> will clearly then have a key role to play. Those who are, who are in the, their, their 20s uh, today are going to be the key policy makers at that point in time, at least many of them. Do you see evidence that the conservative ideas that you and others are bringing forward are satisfying uh, this uh, ages-old youthful desire uh, to uh, make life easier and more meaningful for everyone, you know, this idealism? I think the, the movement among young people toward conservative ideas is one of the most encouraging things that we've seen here at Heritage in the last 10 years. We have a very intensive program here that we call our third generation program. Every other Wednesday night downstairs at, here at the Heritage Foundation we have a lecture given by one member of the third generation, critiqued by other members of the third generation. Uh, the first collection of those has already been published in a hardbound book by a major New York publishing firm, been widely reviewed. But more importantly, what you have is a lively exchange of views among people broadly considered conservatives, all of them, virtually without exception, under the age of 30, all of them very vigorously involved in the war of ideas. You'll have, on the one hand, a libertarian, perhaps someone from our friends over at the Cato Institute, uh, debating with one of our other friends from over at, say, the Free Congress Foundation, where they tend to be more what we call new right. And these different factions within the conservative movement, if you will, uh, stressing different points, uh, emphasizing different parts of their philosophy, but still broadly under the same umbrella of conservative new ideas. And that, I think, is what's really grabbing many, many younger people. And I see this also as I travel around to college and university campuses in the country, that conservative ideas that 25 or 30 years ago when I was on a college campus, uh, we were very much in a minority, those of us who held those viewpoints. Uh, whereas today, it's very much the mainstream ideas. It is the trendy thing to call yourself a conservative and to embrace conservative ideas. When now, that, that, that doesn't mean, though, that every... Uh, student on a college campus who endorses conservative ideas 
has necessarily sat down and read Friedman and Hayek and Russell Kirk or let alone Edmund Burke and Adam Smith and individuals from an earlier century, despite being just a, an earlier generation. But what it does mean is that their gut, in, gut instinct is basically right. And if we can then build on that and translate that into a real intellectual foundation where they can do some independent thinking and come to sensible conclusions, I think the future is ours. When did you first call yourself a conservative? I guess I consciously adopted the label when I was in my early undergraduate days at Regis College in Denver, where, believe me, back in 1959 and 60, it was not very fashionable to call yourself a, a conservative. In Were fact, you interested uh, in, in politics before that? Uh, as a high school student, did you have any exposure? Not, not real practical exposure to politics. Uh, back in the uh, mid-50s, uh, my family, in fact, very, very infrequently talked about politics. But what they did bring me up with was uh, a very real belief in, again, those traditional American values. Uh, we not only had a good, stable family life that was uh, religiously centered, we also, I also learned at a very early age that I was going to be responsible for my own uh, self in terms of spending money, in terms of uh, trying to provide for myself as much as I was able. So I had the usual, back then at least it was usual, uh, newspaper routes and uh, <laughs> lawn cutting jobs and uh, had a little garden in the backyard and sold vegetables to the neighbors and uh, things like that at a very early age, 11, 12 years old. By the time I was 15, I had three different part-time jobs at the same time and uh, I guess have been described by my sisters at least in the intervening years as, a, as an entrepreneur even back then. Did you and have a childhood hero? Did I have a childhood hero? I suppose Douglas MacArthur came as close as anybody to a childhood hero. Here was a man who was bigger than life, who had uh, made such a difference individually in terms of the U.S. Uh, presence in the Pacific. Uh, and I suppose he, more than, say, an Eisenhower or a Churchill, who then seemed like a very distant figure, or any of the other greats of the mid-20th century, uh, was, was the closest thing to a childhood hero. Was there an individual who, who had a significant influence on your education? The individual who did uh, is uh, a, a person who I've, I've stayed in touch with uh, during the intervening years. In fact, we're very proud that he's uh, an adjunct scholar here at the Heritage Foundation. That was Dr. Bernard Sheehan. Uh, Bernie was then a very young assistant professor at Regis College of History. Uh, he now is a full professor at Indiana University in their Department of History. But what he did was introduce me to some of the greats, to Eric von Kuhnelt the Dean's Liberty or Equality, then to Russell Kirk's The Conservative Mind, and through those I then ran into the, the journal National Review. And by the time I was in college, uh, I guess my heroes had changed from uh, great military or political uh, people like a MacArthur or a Churchill or even an Eisenhower to uh, intellectuals, really, to people like Kunal Ledeen. Wouldn't it be neat to be able to sit down and spend an evening talking to him? Or to Russell Kirk, who, again, I'm very proud, is a distinguished scholar here at Heritage and who comes in here every several months. And Bill Buckley, one of the real leaders of the conservative movement. And uh, one person who was then and has remained very, very special to me and uh, recently to our family, uh, namely Claire Booth Luce. And Claire Booth Luce uh, was a, uh, an aloof and distant kind of character at the time, someone who was uh, uh, just a, uh, an almost legendary figure, larger than life, if you will, who had uh, been very much uh, involved in public policy questions as congresswoman, as ambassador to Italy, uh, and was very much at the, at the center of things. Of course, her husband was the founder and publisher of Time and Life and the whole cadre of their, their books. But, uh, it wasn't until many, many years later that I ever met her or had any dealings with her, which uh, remain, I think, 
to this day, uh, certainly one of the highlights of, of our life. But in terms of a role model, in terms of somebody who proved that from fairly modest beginnings, uh, she could conquer just about uh, any, any challenge in front of her, uh, she was certainly one of them. Before you ended up in the political arena, if you would, uh, you attended Wharton School of Business. What led you there? Somewhere along the line, it, uh, as an undergraduate student, and uh, as I had the opportunity also to spend a, a couple of summers studying, in one in, in England and one in Scotland, I uh, became convinced that my future definitely did not lie in the profession of the law. I had a number of uh, my father's friends who were lawyers, but I decided that that was a little too dry and dusty for me. Whereas my undergraduate degree in studying in both business administration and in the more precise discipline of economics led me to believe that, in fact, uh, management and the running of businesses, uh, the process, if you will, not just the, the end product, but the process, was very, very important. I looked around at some of the better business schools and uh, was very fortunate and, uh, I guess, to be accepted. I joked with the dean of the graduate school at Wharton not long ago that uh, it's a good thing I went there when I did because I'm sure I'd never get in now. But it is, uh, I think, it's proven very, very useful to me in, in later life to be able to apply some of the management techniques to actually running today the Heritage Foundation, which after all is a 130-man uh, operation with a 11 or $12 million annual budget. So it's, uh, in fact, I'm, I'm here as partly as an administrator and as, as well, obviously, as a fundraiser and an idea man. But combining those different roles into the role of chief executive here, uh, I don't think I could have been better prepared than to have, have gone to the Wharton School. You describe Heritage Foundation as a conservative think tank. Mm -hmm. How do you define conservative? I define conservative broadly in the, the context of the ideas we believe in. Uh, again, those ideas are uh, supporting traditional American values, uh, the, the need for individual liberty, basic freedom, uh, within a framework of law, if you will, and the need also, enunciated so well in our Constitution, uh, for the federal government to provide for the common defense. And I think all those components in terms of traditional values, uh, freedom under the law, uh, the opportunity for individuals to grow to their their fullest extent, to be able to uh, mature and make the most of themselves, uh, combined with an efficient government that's able to uh, ward off the predators who are always out there, uh, come together in terms of my own, I guess you'd say, political definition of conservatism. If I were to define conservatism more broadly, or in more, in some respects, I guess you could say in, in more detail, in terms of uh, personal actions, uh, they'd be, they'd center around uh, concepts like uh, not only a, a deep personal belief in and commitment uh, to a, a God-centered existence, also to a, a belief that uh, an individual should be proud of whatever he does. Never do, do something that you'd be ashamed of someday. And I think that's a fundamental, uh, sensible attitude, but also a fundamental conservative view. So all these kind of vague generalities come together in terms of forming my own political philosophy, and I hope then uh, uh, to evidence those through, through my specific activities. Not a very specific answer, but the best I can do, I guess, off the top of my head. What are your definitions, and this may in fact uh, bring you back to the definition of conservative, how do you define liberal and libertarian? What are, what are the basic differences between conservatives and those other two viewpoints? Mm -hmm. Well, I'll define liberal in the American sense, because yes, liberal, I, I liberal in the European sense, uh, 
comes very, very close to, I guess, what we would call a conservative in the American sense. So, but a liberal over here is an individual who is much less suspicious of government activity, particularly government activity in terms of, quote, solving some of the domestic problems. A conservative, on the other hand, is, is very skeptical of the ability of government to solve those problems. We're skeptical for, I think, good and sufficient reasons. Uh, the track record of the government in terms of not solving it, uh, the fact that government tends to displace private sector initiatives, either through individuals or through uh, voluntary groups, charities or whatever, in terms of solving those domestic problems. But a liberal tends to put his faith in government and in governmental action, whereas a conservative does not. A libertarian, on the other side, and generally I, I tend to agree with libertarians very much on economic issues in terms of commitment to free trade and, and the free economic system. But a libertarian, to my mind at least, doesn't have a sufficient appreciation for our, our fundamental structure of the Constitution, the, the structure of the rule of law, that there have to be uh, both uh, written laws, but also a common heritage that a people have absorbed over the decades and now, in the case of our national experience, over the centuries. That there is, as Russell Kirk points out, a, a bond between the, the born, uh, the dead, and the yet to be born that represents a continuity, really, of Western civilization that goes on and on. And those common threads that hold us together as a people and hold us together from generation to generation, I think, are very, very important. And some of my libertarian friends, not all of them, but some of them, I think, tend to minimize those. That's why they say it doesn't really matter if there's pornography on the local street corner or whatever because the individual ought to be free to go in and accept it or reject it. Or it doesn't really matter if an individual wants to go out and smoke marijuana on his own because he's only hurting himself. Well, it does matter. It matters to the common, the common wheel, if you will, the common consensus of American people as to what is and what is not socially acceptable behavior, as to what does and, and what is and is not permitted. And I think those, those kinds of, of questions are, are very, very important ones. And I'm not here to try and impose my religious views or my moral concerns on anybody else. But I think, again, that there is that, that common basis out there that we as a people have had, and that hopefully, not only conservatives, but liberals and libertarians as well, can come together and rebuild in terms of what a, a common consensus of uh, the right kind of society is. And that means a, a society that basically is, for one thing, centered around a traditional family as much as possible. That doesn't mean that there aren't exceptions and that there aren't uh, occasions where, uh, for one reason or another, the traditional family is not the core nucleus of what, our, what makes up our society. But by and large, I believe it is. And I, by and large, I believe it's something that ought to be accepted. The traditional family is, is not just a one more alternative lifestyle, is what I'm saying. And those kinds of, of basic concepts, I think, have to be rebuilt among the American people in terms, again, of, of the, the common core of uh, values and traditions that we have together. You recently said, <coughs> quote, we man the ivory towers as well as the trenches in this war of ideas, unquote. Please explain that. It gets back to the, the initial point I made that, again, ideas move the world and ideas really do have consequences. The ideas that may in fact start from the ivory towers uh, that yet again have to then be uh, brushed up, be made practical, uh, and, and made available to the policymakers in the, the political trenches, if you will, here in Washington. And I don't mean political trenches in terms of elections. I, I define politics in as having two forms, electoral politics and policy politics. And on the electoral politics side, that's not the heritage role. Somebody else is going to decide who's elected and uh, how to run a campaign and that sort of thing. But when it gets down to policy politics, 
That is what we're involved in. And that means, again, not just taking those ideas from the ivory tower, but making those ideas politically acceptable so that the, the people over in the Congress or in the administration are willing to accept them as new ideas and as ideas that will actually solve some of the problems we face. And we hope as ideas that advance those basic fundamental beliefs that I've already enumerated. Well, staying, if you would, in the ivory towers for a moment, isn't it fair to say that you start your research on a public policy issue with an established point of view? We start our research on a public policy uh, question with a certain set of principles that I've already enumerated, a belief that generally, by and large, most of the time, more or less, uh, the federal government is not the best way to solve a problem. That generally, by and large, more or less, it will be solved much better through the private sector. And a, a basic set of well, principles, I guess, in that regard. Not with a, a point of view. I think our, for example, one of our major uh, emphases this year and for the next few years, I'm sure, will be on the whole subject of privatization. That is, turning over programs that currently are operated by the government to the private sector, where they can be both operated more efficiently and effectively, and also help to reduce the, the growing impact of the federal government on the life of the citizen. And that is, is a, I think, a very signal uh, development, because if we were a, a conservative institution, say, 30 or 35 years ago, chances are we wouldn't be in favor of privatization. We'd be simply in favor of abolishing the whole damn program. Uh, today, in effect, what I guess I'm saying is we have probably accepted some of those basic premises uh, that underlie uh, the broad, again, the broad consensus of the American body politic, because that broad consensus does gradually uh, change over time. But then there are ways that are better than other ways in terms of how you deliver those services. And we don't think, again, that government is a very efficient deliverer of services. And that comes down to, uh, in, in specific cases like uh, well, whether it has to do with welfare reform or education for that matter, that let's face facts, uh, in the, as we move toward the year 2000 in the United States, the broad American consensus is that every young person ought to have a, an education and that if they can't get it from another way, for example, through private or parochial schools, that the federal government ought to provide that, or that the government at least ought to provide it, not the federal government. That we, if we in fact as conservatives are going to resist even that kind of broad, uh, very broad consensus, we're basically not in the public policy arena. But what we can do in terms of being in the public policy arena is say, hey, wait a minute, if that's a given, what's the best way or are there better ways of providing that kind of service? We think there are, whether it has to do with tuition tax credits so that an individual, in fact, gets a, a credit against his income taxes for the tuition he pays, or whether it has to do with vouchers where instead of sending kids to either be bused across town or, to, for that matter, to their local neighborhood public school. They have a voucher that entitles them to use it at any school of their choosing. And perhaps the voucher needs to be topped off with a little more money. In fact, when the, the voucher system has been experimented with in, in various localities, uh, the people who have been most enthusiastic about it have been the people in the, in the inner city ghettos because they know that education is important for their young people, and they know that they're not getting an adequate education where they are. So if they have an opportunity to get out of that, that uh, milieu that they're in and, and rise up, it's going to be because of education, and the only way to get good education is to move around. And you can't do that with the current system. So what I'm saying is that, yes, we come in with a certain set of principles, but then we try to apply those principles to dealing with real problems. We're not going to sit over here in our our ivory tower and say, uh, uh, no, uh, the young people of America are not entitled to be educated. So you're really doing applied research, and the, and the question isn't, is limited government desirable? In the context of heritage, that's a given. The question is, 
one, how do we uh, maintain uh, the uh, or, or restrict the continued growth of government and ultimately how do we slowly move back to a limited situation, more limited situation? Well, I'll answer that in two ways. First of all, most political change occurs at the margin. It's a marginal change of a few degrees here or there. Uh, that's due to a large combination of factors of uh, vested interests and bureaucracies that make substantial uh, change much more difficult to achieve and much, much less likely to be achieved. You do have during the time of the political cycle a certain short interval in there where you can make substantive political change, but it's a, it's a fairly narrow window and there's only a few things that can happen during that time period. So that, I would say, is, uh, is the first uh, part of my answer. The second part of the answer is, in terms of being the applied engineers, yes, I think that's true. We're not the, uh, the Watts. We're not around to uh, invent the steam engine. What we are around to do is to decide that a steam engine can be uh, applied to a uh, moving vehicle that's... Uh, got uh, steel wheels that can run on steel rails and uh, become the railroad. That, In other words, to be applied engineers rather than original inventors. To take the ideas of some of the greats, the Hayeks, the Freedmans, the others I've already mentioned, and basically bring those together and apply them in the public policy arena to real pressing problems of the day. And that's, uh, that's a, uh, a different role, I guess, from what some pure academics do at their universities, or even for that matter what some think tanks do. That's one of the reasons. For example, 1980-81, one of the major events that really put Heritage on the map was the publication of our major study, Mandate for Leadership. And what Mandate for Leadership did, very, very large volume, 1,093 pages, 31 chapters, more than 300 people worked on the task forces to put it together. And it came up with 3,000 specific recommendations of how you could change the federal government and move it in a more conservative direction. What bills should be passed, what executive orders should be adopted, could be signed by the president with a stroke of a pen, uh, how you move the boxes around on the organization chart. Very practical, applied research like that. I can give you examples of, of how effective it was, because we believe it was very effective. But at the same time, one of our, our very friendly uh, rivals in the think tank business, came out with a volume of about the same size uh, that had a series of maybe 20 or 25 chapters talking in broad, vague generalities about the desirability of a free market and the desirability of uh, the free enterprise system and deregulation of the economy and all the rest. But it wasn't specific enough. Oh, it was fine for the editorial page editor of the Wall Street Journal to uh, develop a, uh, an editorial on, but it, it wasn't answering the real needs of the policymakers down here. So I guess what you could say is that in some respects, we're a little bit further downstream in terms of the policy process than some other think tanks, and certainly than most other academics working individually on college and university campuses. You <laughs> did graduate studies in Britain. You mentioned that. Was that during the high point of the socialist government in, in the UK? It was not only during the high point of the uh, Wilson government, uh, socialists in the, the mid-1960s, it was also at a time when uh, Vietnam was becoming very unpopular, not only here in the United States, but also overseas. And I remember going around at the invitation of uh, some officials in the American Embassy in London and speaking at different schools in and around London and trying to defend the U.S. position in Vietnam and uh, being pelted with tomatoes and whatnot. I remember during the time I was the London School of Economics working with people who are now uh, friends and colleagues really in the academic community like uh, Suda Shinoy, who is a professor in Australia. When she and I started the Old Whig Society at the London School of Economics and we used to uh, try and sell very low cost, uh, two shillings and sixpence as I recall, different publications from groups like the Institute for Economic Affairs or the Foundation for Economic Education here in the United States, other things, 
One time, Suda and I and the five or six others who were involved in this little group, uh, we had a little uh, table that displayed our, our wares. I think we had it on Wednesday noontime. But, uh, we rather mistakenly uh, left the table unguarded for a few minutes, came back, found all of our literature as well as our whole money box had been stolen, which uh, uh, convinced us that perhaps we ought not be uh, quite so trusting in terms of the, uh, the free debate that was going on then at the London School of Economics <laughs> in very practical terms. Well, in addition to that very, very personal example, uh, can you tell us about any observations you made at that time of, the ex of extreme examples of the negative impact of, of the socialist policy on the average person in Britain? Well, I had a, an extraordinary learning experience at that time, and it was not in the classroom. It was a learning experience as a young research assistant at the Institute for Economic Affairs, Lord Harris of High Cross's organization, where I would spend two or three afternoons a week doing research on some of their projects. And IEA, as it's called, in London, was really the first organization to dissect with a fine scalpel the welfare state, to point out how basically very desirable goals, health care for the average citizen, uh, good education for everybody, how those very desirable goals were being just ridden roughshod over and, and not being responded to at all by the government monopolies that were then in place in, in the welfare state of Great Britain in the 1960s. And it was those basic examples pulled together by Ralph Harris, Arthur Selden, and their colleagues at IEA and others inside the UK that, in a similar pattern to the one I already outlined about the United States, that really gave the intellectual foundation what eventually became the Thatcher Revolution in the United Kingdom. But yes, you could see it in everything, from uh, major debates, I remember at the time, as to whether or not individuals would be charged 30 cents, uh, the equivalent of 30 cents then, uh, for a prescription, or whether the prescriptions would be free. Well, the labor government, in, in their fine wisdom, decided to make them free to everybody. Well, basic economics will tell you that if, if you have a free good out there, uh, the demand is virtually going to be unlimited. So all of a sudden, demand for prescriptions started to increase. Uh, the projected initial uh, cost of running the prescription service through the national health insurance was staggeringly underestimated. The costs went through the ceiling. Uh, inflation followed. Wage and price controls followed after that. And you had a whole series of little examples like that that led to the cumulative, uh, almost the ruin really, of the British economy by the end of the 60s and into the early 70s. I'm not saying that it all happened because uh, prescriptions were suddenly free, but that was just one little example of the kind of thing that the government was then passing. Mm -hmm. All, and all, of course, in the, uh, the name of, of helping the common man, of uh, doing good for the little guy. Well, of course, they weren't helping the common man, because the common man, the little guy, is the person who's most adversely impacted when the government doesn't perform its most basic functions, whether that is common defense or whether that is, for, I think, another basic function of government, that is maintaining a, a steady, stable currency that people can have confidence in, in other words, in f avoiding inflation. Is it fair to say that good intentions are at the root of most of uh, government's failures? I think. Most government programs are genuinely based on good intentions. Uh, the good intentions can lead to some successes in the governmental sector if, if the incentives are there and if choice is there. I guess choice, going back to an earlier question you raised, choice is one of the key words that defines somebody on the right by that. I mean, whether you consider yourself a conservative or a libertarian. You want the individual to have as much opportunity for free choice, for uh, choice among as large a range of options as possible, whereas a traditional liberal or leftist socialist will tend to constrain those options 
into a much narrower band. So, yes, uh, good intentions, when they're mandated by government, uh, when they're enforced on the public citizenry as single options, often, well, almost inevitably, I would say, are one of the reasons why government programs go wrong. Margaret Thatcher and her, her government uh, have, as you indicated, uh, made a dramatic change in Britain. With our form of government in the United States, is it going to be harder to reverse government growth? Do we have a tougher job ahead of us? I think because of our system of checks and balances that it was harder for us to go down the slippery road uh, into big government where we basically still are, despite some of the good inten intentions of Ronald Reagan and his colleagues over the last years. The, the pendulum doesn't swing as wide in our system as it does in the UK. If you have a, uh, a Harold Wilson or another left-wing laborite in, in government, they can basically undo a great deal of what Mrs. Thatcher has done. Uh, on the other hand, a Thatcher can come in and she can make some very, very substantial changes because basically she's got her majority in the House of Commons. The House of Lords might be able to delay something, but it's not really going to be able to stop the, the direction that a prime minister wants to go. Whereas over here, with that system of checks and balances, you've, you're never going to go, I suppose, quite as bad but you're also going to have a much more difficult time in terms of getting back on the straight and narrow. And we see that day in and day out in terms, not just partisan terms of Democrat versus Republican, but you see it in terms of the way the system back here in Washington basically is breaking down on so many fronts. The budget process, for example, a subject that we've studied intensively here at the Heritage Foundation. Presumably back in 1974 when the Congress passed the Current Budget Act. The objective was somehow this was uh, going to solve the problem. We were now going to produce budgets through this new process. We've established a new budget committee that's going to give everybody their broad marching orders and somehow that's going to work both with the, the individual authorizing committees and also with the appropriations committees, et cetera. They've got a whole series of very specific guidelines and we will meet those guidelines. Well, they haven't met the guidelines in the last seven or eight years. In effect, the Congress, year after year, time after time, has been violating its own laws. They're not just procedures. These are laws. And the Congress is violating it time after time after time. What happens inside the executive branch, on the other hand? You have, and I, I see this because I serve on a couple of advisory boards and commissions to different departments of the government. You have some very well-meaning people, both political appointees and career civil servants, sitting in, trying to come up with their best estimate as to what it will take to run their department. And yes, we can sit down, we can argue about the, the desirability of even having this, that, or the other department of government. But they go through and they do their sums and uh, add this, subtract that, uh, maybe even make some substantial changes. It all goes over to the White House. It's coordinated at the Office of Management and Budget. And they cut a little more. It goes back to the departments. The department's appeal. It comes up to an appeal board. It comes out in this massive document every February uh, from the government printing office that the president presents. It's his budget. What's happened the last three years in a row? The leadership in the Congress has declared the president's budget dead on arrival. So what do they do? They sit there, try to rework the whole thing. Uh, eventually, as happened late 1987, get to the point at the end of the year where they haven't passed a single appropriation bill. They roll them all together into one huge thing they call a continuing resolution. And the president has a choice of either signing this. It, it's, it's unfair to even call it a Christmas tree. It's got so many different ornaments hanging on it. It's, it has everything imaginable in it, not just budget numbers, but so many different policy prescriptions, uh, whether or not uh, equal time provisions are going to be imposed by the Federal Communications Commission, whether or not an individual can own both a newspaper and a television station in the same city. Things that have nothing to do with the budgeting process. All these things are put on as additional ornaments, in addition to all 13 of those appropriations bills being put together 
the president is given a choice. Either sign it or close the whole government down. Now, sometimes, speaking very candidly, I think it'd be probably better to just close the government down and just see if we couldn't do without it for a couple of weeks uh, until the Congress came back and got its good sense. Yes, I've had that uh, reaction yes. many times. Uh, the fact is uh, woof, that by political uh, people inside the administration. That's never, I guess, really been considered as a serious option. So the, the president has to hold his nose and sign the thing. It's, uh, it puts things into a very uh, uh, unequal and uh, distorted kind of perspective and makes it, makes it very, very difficult to explain or defend uh, the democratic process here, here in the United States. And certainly makes it difficult for the average American citizen to, to figure out uh, what exactly some of these guys back here are doing. There was a story about one small line item, relatively small by Washington standards when you're talking about a multi-billion dollar piece of legislation, an item for $8 million for a particular school situation. And one senior member of the House of Representatives came up and on the House floor and said to his colleague across the aisle, in effect, what are you complaining about? It's only a lousy $8 million. Well, if the politicians here in Washington consider it only a lousy $8 million, I think those of us outside the Capitol Beltway, those in real America, ought to just be outraged. In effect, what he's saying is, I'm perfectly content to wipe out the entire net worth of eight people who scrimped and saved all their lives and are now able to call themselves millionaires in order to fund this one little thing over there. And he's willing to come out and publicly say that. Uh, and that's just one small example of uh, the mindset that seems to uh, envelop some people down here. How do we respond to it? How do we get around it? Well, there are, of course, some traditional ideas that have bounced around, having to do with line item vetoes and balanced budget tax limitation amendments, spending freezes, things like that. What I'm hoping my colleagues here at Heritage are going to be doing more than that even is looking at possible incentive systems. Is there some way, and I'm, this is a serious idea that I'd really like to look at, is there some way to build in a positive personal incentive to the members of Congress to act responsibly? Whether it involves, for example, uh, dock their salary, $1,000 for every billion dollars of deficit, but increase it, give them a bonus in effect for every billion dollars of surplus. At the same time, you'd have to write in a, a tax limitation provision where they couldn't do it simply by increasing taxes. Is there some way that you can give them, in effect, a positive incentive to do good? I don't know. It's one of the questions we're looking at. And I hope that these kinds of questions are going to be uh, the sorts of things that are addressed in both political campaigns and here in the Congress in the years ahead. You mentioned privatization as a very important issue. Uh, can you uh, give us a uh, quick report on the influence that Heritage has had on that particular issue? I'd love to, because privatization is, in fact, one of our major issues here at Heritage. And it's a major issue for a whole series of reasons. I already mentioned the fact that we have an inherent bias in favor of the private sector. But beyond that, beyond the fact that we believe that the private sector could perform these duties more efficiently, could uh, perform the services more effectively, uh, deliver them uh, better, et cetera. What privatization has the possibility of doing is changing the whole political dynamics in the country. What it can do is give to whole groups of people a real stake in the system. Let me give you an example. When Conrail was first proposed, the the Northeast Regional Railroad System that had been nationalized. When it was first proposed for privatization, uh, the first proposal that came in in terms of accepting it was from the Norfolk and Southern Railway System. My colleagues here at Heritage didn't like that very much. We didn't like it, first of all, because we didn't believe that their offer in terms of paying for these assets to the federal government was as large as it should be. But much more importantly, what we really believed was that with Conrail, you had an opportunity for empowering a whole new group of American citizens, giving them all a stake in the 
in the process. If, for example, a certain amount of the Conrail stock were to be reserved for cities that Conrail ran through, if, for example, a certain amount were to be reserved for employees, people in the unions, uh, perhaps for frequent users, uh, why couldn't, if Amtrak were to be privatized, why couldn't there be a, a, a frequent flyer program uh, in effect for Amtrak where you'd uh, receive a bonus in terms of Amtrak stock? in order to encourage you to have a stake in the system. But anyway, back to Conrail. What you could do with this sort of thing, both on that kind of a, a macro scale, with a very large multi-billion dollar process, as well as on the micro scale, is give people a stake in the system. This, again, is a lesson I think we've learned from Mrs. Thatcher. I was in England not long ago when she turned over the keys to the one millionth council house. Council house is, of course, public housing. They're owned by the government in the British case, usually by local governments, town councils. It was turned over to the, to the sitting tenant, who then became the owner. They now had a mortgage to pay. They had responsibilities for their own property. What has happened is not only have those owners of those council houses taken much better care of them in terms of repairs, in terms of keeping them up and landscaping their little gardens and this sort of thing, what it's also done is give them a stake broadly in the system so that they are no longer out there trying to figure out what government can do for them. Instead, they're starting to realize what government is doing to them. And quite frankly, what it's doing is making them to be uh, much more conservatively inclined politically, uh, which I kind of like as a, as a spin-off as well. But more fundamentally than that even, as I say, it's giving them a real stake in the system. And anything we can do in terms of encouraging that kind of attitude through privatization, I think is very, very important. And that's why I'm so proud of the, f the work that Stuart Butler and his colleagues here in our domestic policy unit at Heritage have done on privatization. Stuart's written the definitive book and any number of papers on it. We were the people who put together the original uh, concept of the Presidential Commission on Privatization, which is now, of course, in, a, in being and looking for opportunities to privatize. Because again, we believe in competition. We believe in choice. I believe, very frankly, that it's much better that if I have a, a letter that I want to have delivered to Chicago tomorrow morning, that I've got a choice of going to United Parcel or Emory or Federal Express or Express Mail through the Postal Service. Fifteen years ago, most people seem to forget we didn't have that choice. We were stuck with the Postal Service. Well, the more choices we've got, whether it has to do with the delivery of first-class mail or whether it has to do with uh, transportation, housing, education, I've already talked about extensively, all those areas are ripe for privatization, and not just because it's more, more efficient or more effective, but also because it expands the range of choice and gives the individual, can give the individual, more of a stake in society. In a recent issue of Policy Review, <coughs> the Heritage Journal of which you are the publisher, there was an article titled, Where We Failed, by 14 former Reagan officials. How would you answer that question? I think the Reagan administration basically net-net, if you will, in, in the real estate phrase, uh, has been quite a positive development for conservatives. It's changed the whole framework of the debate. The rhetoric is very different today, and rhetoric means a lot. And the way that the debate is framed can often determine the outcome of the debate. That's one of the major accomplishments. I could go through and enumerate other specific policy achievements of the Reagan administration. But I think the, the fundamental failing of the Reagan administration has to be traced back to the very early days. And this comes through in those interviews with those 14 individuals. The first failing was in terms of people. One of my fundamental beliefs is people are policy. You've got to have the right people in the right position in order to change that policy. They didn't appoint good people, necessarily, and they didn't appoint people fast enough to these positions. Then what happened was, as they kind of gradually came in, they, the people tended to be briefed by individuals who were already on the scene, who basically had a, a vested interest in maintaining the status quo. So what you, what you had was, instead of the kind of radical change that we were talking about, you ended up with a, a very 
narrow marginal kind of change. The other problem was they didn't go fast enough, hard enough on issues at the time. The obvious uh, opportunities that were there early in 1981 were, were simply lost. And this, I think, was one of the great, the great tragedies and one of the great failings of the Reagan administration. But fundamentally, I'm upbeat about the future because, again, I don't think the conservative movement depends on the failings of, or the successes of one political candidate or one president of the United States. It's going to be a long, gradual process of renewing those conservative ideas, keeping them at the forefront, and trying to influence public policy with them.